Coaches, we have a treat for you today. We have Dave Smart, Carleton University. Many times over, I would call him one of the best coaches in the world and great unique ways of thinking about the game. And first part of this two-part series is going to talk a little bit more about philosophy, competition, holding players accountable. And then in part two, we'll get into a little bit more of the technical tactical. But You'll be fascinated listening to both parts of these. And if you're interested in more information on Dave at davesmartbasketball.com, you can check out some of the all-access videos as well. But enjoy part one. Welcome Dave Smart to the Basketball Podcast, davesmartbasketball.com. Dave, we're grateful to have you here. And we're grateful that you took an opportunity this year to be able to share some videos, some all-access videos of your practices at Carlton and that you provided a in-depth coaching clinic as well as a part of that series talking about your defensive philosophy. So first off, welcome to the podcast. Thanks for having me. Looking forward to it. Well, I think so many people are looking forward to this and I think everyone marvels at your success and the consistency of your success. And we'll get right into technical tactical, you know, and there's more to what you've done, obviously, than technical tactical. But for the sake of this podcast, we're going to circle around that and philosophy as well, because if you've watched those practices, one of the things you'll notice is that often you're not coaching technical tactical, that you're coaching human beings to be better in so many ways. Can you talk about that a little bit first in terms of how you're coaching your players? Yeah, I think a lot of it has evolved to that too. I mean, if it was very different early on than it is now in that I have got guys who have been through our program for five years and guys who have coached for, well, in Rob's case, for a number of years. So I trust from a technical standpoint that when I break it up, they can comfortably do that. And that's something that they're very competent in doing. So whereas early on, I had less experience guys in terms of what I wanted to do working with me. But now I can really focus on, you know, the players and the guys understanding why they need to do things and what they're doing, but more importantly, why they're doing it. And just their body language and their sort of motivation to do it. I mean, one of our big things is it's impossible to be special at something if you're not having fun doing it. And the irony in that is I think a lot of people go, well, if you go play for Dave Smart, it's not going to be fun. Well, no, it's not going to be my nine-year-old kid's fun playing Lego. What we talk about all the time is it has to be fun for you to be special. So in order to be special at basketball, you're going to have to redefine what your fun is. Well, and that's an important point because, again, I think we talk about this at the highest level is fun is not frivolous. Fun is improving. Fun is competing. Fun is winning. And that's really what you're talking about in terms of that is that desire to get better, which is fun. And that desire to win, which is fun as well, because, you know, you and I both know it's more fun to win than to lose. Right. And again, it seems like a simple concept, like redefining your fun, but some people really struggle with it and they struggle with really truly having it fun like they'll talk the talk and they'll say the right thing but ultimately when push comes to shove the ones who really enjoy the process and I mean I'm not big on the whole process thing but I do agree that there is a process to get to wherever you want to get to but the ones who really enjoy the hard work they want more like they're excited about more they're not looking at the clock at practice unless they're looking and going, oh, no, I, like I only have 20 more minutes to get better. And, you know, our guys, not every one of them, I don't think every player on any team all have fun. I mean, it, sometimes it's a lot of the times based on playing time, but there's different ways to have fun. But most of our guys have as much fun as any players do in the country. It's just a different type of fun. Well, and again, that's important. And two things to clarify for coaches. When you talked about Rob, you talked about longtime assistant coach, uh, Rob Smart Jr. And so your coaching staff is more experienced. Your players are more experienced at this point because you've got so many go through the system and had so much success. So let's ask this. First of all, what do you mean by you don't like using the word process or talking about process? Well, I don't know. I mean, it's more sort of, you've known me for a long time. I kind of, the way I approach this is I almost sort of see something and I go, ah, that makes sense, but I don't want to make it sort of a commonality. Like they see it every day on Instagram. They see it every day on social media, like the process. So it's like, I get it and I agree with it, but I want to use, I want to attack it in a different way. Like, and, and I also, I kind of want them to want to be successful that minute. 
knowing that they're not going to be successful that minute, it's going to take time, but driving to be successful that minute so that they're putting everything they have into getting it done as quick as possible and, and working as hard as they can in the moment, as opposed to saying, you know what? Yeah, this isn't going right, but it's a process. I'll get there. I'll, I'll get there. Well, you're not going to get, in my mind, you're not going to get there if you don't push the envelope, if you don't think outside the box, if you don't attack the situation in a, I want to fix it today. On the other hand, if that's the only way you look at it, you're not going to get where you want to get to that quick. And if you get discouraged by it, you're in trouble. So trying to find that happy medium where, you know, you're not procrastinating almost because you know it's a process. It'll take time and I don't have to really panic over today. I want them to panic over today, but at the end of the day, not panic over today. You know, that today didn't get me as far as I thought it would. Well, and it's your understanding as a coach, but you don't want them to think that way. That you understand that they're not always going to be their best, but you want them to approach it every day to be their best. And you don't want them to have an excuse, basically. And that's what you're saying. You're not a program of cliches, which I totally understand what you're saying. There's no excuse. I mean, if you practice today, you should be your best. But on the inside, you know that they're not always going to be their best because you're creating conditions where they're going to fail constantly in practice. Right. And I think as a coach, you need to do that. And then you need to recognize when they do fail and pay attention to their feelings. Pay attention when you talk to them to what they're saying. And when guys have tough days, those are the guys you got to talk to right after. And, and, you know, you got to talk, ironically, you got to talk about the fact that it's a process. Today was a good step in that process, even though it was a lot of failures, because failures lead to positives as long as you understand that you're still getting something out of it. But again, for me, with really good coaches, practice doesn't end when practice ends practice ends after you've spoken to all the kids who you feel had a struggle that day. Well, the irony in our situation is some people who are new to the program when the coaching go, well, you go talk to all the kids who struggled that day, but you're the cause to 90% of their struggles. <laughs> of go, course. <laughs> That's why I'm going to talk to them. And tomorrow I might not cause as many struggles for them, but I'll cause those struggles for someone else. But my goal is to make them struggle and then the next day not struggle so much. Like, and it's kind of the process we go through. Well, I get asked a lot clearly about you and your philosophy and how you do things. And for coaches that haven't watched the videos or haven't seen you guys practice, number one, the beauty of what you do is the psychology behind everything. I mean, technical, tactical stuff I think is brilliant too, but don't get me wrong. I mean, it's the psychology of what you do. And I think that's what struck a lot of people when they've watched the videos just this constant psychology that happens within practice. But I equate it to people, and maybe I'm wrong with this, but whenever I explain it to people to completely simplify it, I tell them, here's Dave's philosophy, deep end. Every player is in the deep end constantly, and they have to find a way to swim. And that's basically your goal within every practice from what I've experienced with you, but also from what I understand in terms of, you know, the different psychology that you're approached with. Is that a fair and easy way to be able to explain it to people? Yeah, I think it's a good way to explain it. I mean, the irony in me is that I think that I was a pain in the neck and I am a pain in the neck. Like, I mean, you've known me for years. Like I'm not the yes sir, no sir person. I tend to kind of do my own thing. And when I was a player, I was a nightmare. And so I think one of the things I've been lucky with is I can totally relate to the guys who are kind of a night, like, and kind of take, they're taking shortcuts. So, and they have a tough time sort of getting away with stuff because I see it, I've seen it and I relate to it. And the, the thing about it is the really sort of dedicated good kids, like, I don't want to say good kids, but uh, you know, more disciplined kids you know, and, and more coachable by the stereotype of the world were coachable kids. They can thrive in the system too. And they really tend to get in less hot water than the guys who are more like me. But the guys who are like me, they're in an environment where they really are forced to swim every day. And they don't have those shortcut days because I know what they're thinking a lot of the time because that was me. I mean, and, and a lot of the really solid coaches who I've talked to who sort of say, well, I can't get over the hump. I can't, like, oh, the problem is you're a really good person. 
So your mind works in a way like this is the way people should think. I go, if you could get in my mind and see all the shortcuts I'm thinking in every level, whether it's how wash or like helping with dishes, helping with the driveway at home and at 50, it's like, it would be easier to relate to these problem guys. Well, and you've educated me about this through the years too. And, and you do it within your scoring system that you actually value players who learn how to cheat and find a way to kind of work outside of the constraints or rules that you put into a drill and they found a way to cheat to win and you value that yeah i think it's extremely important because they're trying to now it makes your job difficult because every time they're finding ways to cheat that's hurting the development of your team you have to change the scoring system or the drill but they're thinking outside the box they're challenging you and they're finding ways because within a game i mean you got to find ways there's no sort of like egg in whole way to get it done every single game every game different things happen so you you've got to be able to adjust and i like the guys who i mean for me the best one and and the smartest one was mike smart and i had him for five years plus three years before in club where every new drill it was his opportunity to find the holes how he could win it without, without actually trying as hard as he needed to and you know it was always a game between us and it made him better made me better but it made the other players better right and mike smart for those that know is your nephew but someone who played for you prior to carlton as well in terms of he's been exposed to what you do and he understood it so probably a a great great deep understanding of kind of how to work within your system so let's come back to this then what is the hardest thing let's just think about present day what's the hardest thing for a new player in your program to learn how to do like they haven't been exposed to you, but they understand what they're getting into a little bit. But what do they have to adjust to the most? I think the hardest thing is in this day, I feel, find the highs and the lows. Not getting too high, not getting too low. Like, and understanding the win comes down to are you winning the game to infinity? Not whether you're winning that particular drill. Because you might have just got lucky that I ended the drill at that time. You know, it's, uh, Did you win the game to infinity? And everybody knows whether they're going to win the game to infinity, whether if there was no, no clock, no time on this drill, who is ultimately going to win? And again, that to me, I think is the hardest thing for them to, the two things, just staying level, not getting too down, not pouting, just fighting constantly, and then not getting too high and getting complacent. And again, in order to do that, it's a case of remembering that, It's the winner of the game to infinity that truly wins. There's a difference between a bad person and an evil person within what you do as well, right? Like if someone's, like you're saying Mike Smart, for example, he's kind of being a bad player in a sense that he's always trying to circumvent the rules, but you value that. But when someone's evil, what's the difference in terms of that? Well, I think, first of all, I mean, you know this, I know this, anybody's coach, there's not a lot of evil players. Like, there's some, but not very many. I mean, it, generally people are good at heart, and it's very hard to find someone who is so selfish that you can't get them to buy into something team-wise. Sometimes it's easy, sometimes it's a lot of work to find out what button to push, team thing, what sort of drives them to think about something other than themselves. But, I mean, the guys who are the closest to evil and again i mean it's more the hardest to get to buy in you know they're just they're selfish beyond the others and the way things work now a lot of these kids when they get to grade oh i mean it's getting young now but grade eight nine maybe even earlier for some but definitely by grade eight nine very little is about whether their team wins and whether their team has success Everybody wants to win, but no one needs to win with their teammates. They're looking for the exposure. They're looking for how do I get better? How do I get to the next level? And I get it, except it kills the selflessness. It just becomes everything is about them. And I don't think it's as big a problem as some think it is, because I still think deep down most of these kids want to be liked and want to have relationships and want to have close connections with their team but they've just never been given the opportunity because of the system. And I think at the university level, we give them that opportunity. Because ironically, once they get to the NBA level, it becomes the same thing. 
my next contract, I can be gone in a day, free agency, all like it just becomes all about them. It's very hard to make it about team. Well, and the other part is that when they get to your level or your program and specifically is that you hold them accountable to that too. Can you talk a little bit about some of the ways you hold them accountable to that when you're trying to change behaviors to influence them to be, as in this example, a better teammate? What are some of the things that you do to hold them accountable? Yeah, I mean, I kind of go day to day and just try to read. So, I mean, experience allows me, I think, to make the right call say 70% of the time, 75% of the time, but I'm making a lot of mistakes day to day because I'm trying to read it day to day and trying to find any way possible. But one of the things I talk about with my assistants and, and coaches who, who talk to me about culture, I go, to me, one of the big thing is I don't want to ever have the elephant in the room. And that causes some awkwardness at times, but I don't like it. I don't think it's good for a team to be talking about something when we know everybody's thinking about something else. So we just talk about it. We just bring it up. Whatever the situation may be. Like, I mean, I used to joke with Phil Scrubb saying, holy moly, you've been our best player for four years. Why? Like, you make me feel like a terrible person every single day. And you go, what? I go, well, if I was the best player for four years, There'd be some days where I'm sleeping through practice. There'd be some days where, you know what? I'm pretending I got a sore ankle because what are you going to do? I'm way better than everybody else. And I know I would be doing that every day. You act like you're our 12th man trying to find a way to get into the rotation. Yet you're a hundred times better than everybody else. And every day you make me realize that compared to you, I'm a bad person. But, you know, on the other hand, if the person is our best player and he does act like I would act, I make it clear. Hey, we're at a point where you're acting like a bad person. I mean, you have no respect for your teammates. You think you're better than everybody else. I just want to make sure everybody knows this is why you're acting that way. And I'm not actually having a problem with how you're acting because I probably would act the same way if I was you. But I would recognize that everybody might hate me. As long as you're okay with everybody hating you and we're just using you, you're using us, and see where it goes. Usually when you put it out there, right when the meeting ends with the team, because this is in front of the whole team, they'll come to my office and say, well, I don't, I'm not doing that. And I go, well, you are doing that. And everybody knows you're doing that. Well, I don't want everybody to hate me. Okay, well, here's Phil's number. Call him, because I'm not the guy, because I do what you were doing. Phil has all the answers for being the best player and doing it right. And then we get into a conversation about it. But they have to want to, to change in order for them to change. And I don't think they're going to want to change unless you just make it clear. Like, this is what everybody's thinking. And we started by talking about four types of people in this world. And what group are you in? And we always start every year with that talk. And so, in those four people, I, I think I outlined them in the notes I posted online a while ago of one of your clinic talks. But just quickly outline those four people for us. Well, I mean, again, the descriptions change depending on what you're talking about, but this isn't basketball. This is just when I talk to lawyers, when I talk to executives, when I do speaking engagements all over the place, I talk about the same thing. There's the first group who are incredibly talented, incredibly smart, but they know it. And they think they're incredibly talented and they think they're incredibly smart. And you know what? To me, when it comes to sports, they're the coach killers because everybody, knows they're incredibly talented, knows they're incredibly smart, and they expect the coach to get incredible things out of them. But the coach has really no control over that person because they're so arrogant, they're going to do it when they feel like doing it. So the coach has really no say in it if they're going to allow that person to stay in level one because they think and they know they're more talented and smarter than everybody else. And unfortunately, they act that way. And some days they're great, and some days they're not so great because it's based on what they feel like. Then there's the group two who are incredibly smart, incredibly talented, but they don't see themselves that way. And they don't want to see themselves that way because they want to be part of the team and the group. So every day they're working as if they're group three, which is the person who's not that incredibly smart, not that great talented, and recognize it, but want to become it, and are going to work hard every single day. So group two, they're the ones who make 
us as coaches look way better than we are. I've had a lot of group twos, you know, like I could name 40 guys who are group twos, you know, and Phil Scrub is the perfect example of it, but he's a group two. He was as good or better and as smart or smarter than every player in U Smart, but he probably trained and worked and studied at a level of one of the worst players in youth sport who wanted to find a way to stay on the team. So sorry. And you're trying to recruit those players. Like that's the ideal, right? That's what everybody's trying to recruit. It's just really hard to recruit it. So I think you do your best to recruit it. And the more of them you have in your program and the more that you've developed, the easier it is to recruit the number one and turn them into a number two. It's a whole lot easier to turn a one, number one into number two when your number two is kicking the crap out of your number one every day because he's in third or fourth year and he's way better than that freshman who's always been the man. So everyone's trying to recruit that. Recruiting that is a lot harder, I think, than changing number one into number two. But changing number one into number two is not an easy task either if you're not willing to go fight that fight and win that game to infinity, basically. And then there's the group three who are the absolute key to the team. And they're the key to changing number one into number two. Because number one don't really like number two. Because they're on the same level of talent and intelligence. But everybody likes them more in terms of the coaching staff and the people around because you know, they're just better team people. So they kind of resent those people. So you, you can't use them as the people that number one and number two can fight for. Whereas number three, that group, number one are usually friends with guys in the number three group. And when you make it clear the way they're acting is disrespecting their friends, they tend to want to stop disrespecting their friends. And they tend to want to change. And the number threes have way more influence on the number ones than the number twos do. So to me, they're the absolute key to your team. Absolute key. And the number twos play way harder for them. And same with the number ones. But the number twos play way better when they're on the floor with the number threes because they want to see the number threes have success. And then there's the number fours. And in our world, you just cut those. You know, they last a day. You can tell they think they're really good, and you can tell they stink, and you're able to cut them at our level. When you're a high school teacher, that's why I like high school teachers and respect them to a high level because they got to figure out a way to get that guy who's not talented or that girl who's not that talented, not that smart, who actually thinks they're really talented and really smart, and they got to figure out a way to convince them otherwise. And and I don't envy that position at all that, that high school teachers and elementary school teachers have to get. For those that want to follow that a little bit more, it was coaching thoughts from Dave Smart, Basketball Immersion. And I know you love this title, but ever wonder what a genius thinks. So that's what it was. If they want to go look at that, those levels a little bit more, I think I have a, a little bit of a breakdown there for that. And, uh, or it could be, I think, on the uh, Super Clinic notes as well, which is another blog that uh, I shared some of your ideas. But what all this leads to, which is great, is this- Can we get to the- what a genius thinks in your top. <laughs> Can we just go a minute? So that's what you call it. Yet anybody who said, what would you title your book? I say, even a blind squirrel finds an acorn once in a while. So <laughs> I'm not real. Sometimes you just get lucky. Well, just get lucky. I think every coach should be like to be as lucky as you've been for so long. So, and, and that's a part of it. And, and Dave, I'll say the greatest compliment that I ever pay to you is when I tell people, you never lose to bad teams. And I think that's the most remarkable part about your consistency. And you may consider them bad teams relative to the level of your player, but like looking on the outside, it's not like you have those bad losses to those, or maybe I'm wrong, but have you ever lost to a team that's been under 500? I don't know. I don't know. I don't, I, don't I suspect so. the answer is no. So I don't think so. Yeah. Yeah. So, which to me is the most remarkable part and part of the psychology and the brilliance of whatever you do, and we're getting into that a little bit, is that your players never have that off day against bad teams. Now, some of that is talent. Like sometimes talent just overcomes whatever, but 
there's no question that it's the psychology more than anything that separates a lot of those games. And that's part of it. So getting into leadership, here's another part that I believe is a part of it. And you see a little bit of it in the practice that your players have permission to get on each other for certain things. Can you talk a little bit about that too? Because it's not just anything. They're not allowed to get on each other for anything, but they can coach each other. They can challenge each other. Can you talk about that part of the leadership of your players within your program? Yeah, I mean, we encourage it. We encourage it, but it has to be done the right way. And it has to be done on things that everybody controls. So, I mean, I mean, it's easy to say, but I get very upset when there is not positive or negative reinforcement after every possession in practice you know if if it goes bad i expect there to well again not result if the possession goes bad so in other words if they execute and they get a good shot and and they miss it and the other team just happens to win a battle on the defensive boards to get the board i expect the leaders on the team to be screaming at the rest of the team perfect that's a perfect possession we are not losing if we do that every single time. On the other end, if guys don't rebound, if guys don't sprint lanes, if guys don't communicate, if guys don't get the ball going where it needs to be going, they're expected to be negative. They're expected to be positive. They're expected to be negative. And, and they're expected to care after every single possession. Good or bad, they need to care. I mean, turnovers, I would say 90% of the turnovers, they are not allowed to be negative about. 10% and the 10% are usually with our best players. Like if one of our freshmen turns it over in a practice and someone loses on them, I have a real problem with that because they're not trying to turn the ball over. They're trying to take care of the ball and they need help in terms of whether it's mental or technical help on how to take care of the ball. If Munis is dominating the practice and then comes down the lane and throws behind the back pass out of bounds because he feels like, I got it going and I can do whatever I want and it, it could cost them a win. I expect the guys to jump down his throat as a fourth year guy who's a starter who is clearly doing things that are not based on winning, but based on him just having the wrong kind of fun, you know? And, and so again, but I would say 90% of the turnovers, there should be any negative. The same with shots. I mean, really bad shots. Yes. But again, it's gotta be the right person taking the bad shot to elicit a really negative response. But we expect it to be negative and positive. Well, and it's important to understand that, like, it's defining things. Like, it's not like, again, in your practices, and I have this conversation with a coach all the time, it's not like you're saying, hey, we got we to gotta work harder. Like, it's not general things. And you talked about that a little bit with the elephant in the room. You're very honest, and players are very honest with each other with the things that matter but you've also defined what things matter for your players. So they would understand what those things are. It's not something that's like, we're going to just say in general terms. Right. And, and we stress it every day. And, and, you know, this year, like very good for us because people talk about us winning the national championship and what was the best moment for you as a coach. And I said, well, I, I constantly say to me, not necessarily the best moment because at the time it was like, is it going to happen? But the defining moment of our team and why we won a national championship were the first three quarters against uh, Dalhousie. We could not score. And that's a credit to them, not just like we were having huge struggles, but a lot of that was caused by them. But we could not get anything going the way we normally got things going. And while that was going on, they could not make any separation. Like, no matter how confident they got it, no matter how excited the 6,000 people who were all rooting for Dow got during that game and how everybody's thinking upset, 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 they could not get any separation because our guys defended every possession. They defended every possession. They defended – they rebounded every shot. They just made every possession a nightmare for them. And we couldn't score. And we came into the third quarter down th- after three, down three, and I, all I said to the guys is, well, you know what? You did what we've been asking you to do. You've made it. You've made it a war. You've made everything tough on them. They should be up. If you guys lost faith or you didn't defend, they could be up 15, 20, but you've given them nothing easy. So let's make some shots. And, you know, as they walked on, I said to Rob, 
well, I hope we make some shots because we've only got 10 minutes left. Yeah. And we started making shots. And basically, it really wasn't even a game in the last four minutes, you know, like because we just continued to get stops and we started making shots. But to me, that more than any other game we played all year, those three quarters were the difference between what we were this year and what we were last year. Last year we were talented, but we didn't have anything that we just did better than everybody else. So how do you select your leaders? How do you cultivate a leader? Those things within your program, develop, cultivate, whatever you want to say, but what does that process look like? I mean, again, it's, it's like I said before, you try different things and the key is recognizing when it's not working early enough that you change the direction as opposed to having gone too far down that road where you can't change it. But everybody's different. I mean, I, I was talking to somebody the other day and one of the guys who played for Rob when, during my sabbatical year, you know, I always joke with him saying, you might be the worst leader of human beings I've ever been around. Yet you were probably one of the five best leaders this basketball program's ever had for one year. And he goes, what are you talking about? I go, you have no idea how to lead human beings. But you were an unbelievable leader, Rob's here. And he goes, well, that makes no sense. And I go, it makes total sense. You cared so much about the team and the players on the team. You made four million mistakes and no one cared. No one cared because they knew you cared more about the team and more about them than anybody who'd ever gone through the program. So the fact that you buy the book were the worst leader on the face of the planet didn't matter because it was all made up for with your caring. And I go, I'm suggesting that whatever you do in your future life, either don't try to be a leader or make sure you care about it as much as you cared about your basketball and your basketball team. Because Without caring, you are really bad at leading. And, I mean, he was an unbelievable leader simply because every kid on the team, every player on the team, every coach knew how much he cared. So they just tolerated the craziness and listened to the good and just passed off the bad because, you know, that's okay. He cares. And, you know, whereas other guys like Mike Smart, I'm not even sure. I mean, I think deep down he really did care. But he never really showed that he cared that much. He's just brilliant at leading people. You know, he read people. He said the right things. He cared about people. And he was just, he's just a really, really smart leader. And I do think he cared, but I don't think that played into any of his leadership abilities. So I try to explain again to people, like, such an important part of coaching is not to be reactionary. And it's really hard because obviously there's a lot of emotion and you don't necessarily know how your players are going to react to something. But that's another, what I believe, strength of yours is that it's very thought out. Like how you do things is very thought out. But even when it comes to individual conversations, those mini conversations, what I call them, the things that really grow your leaders and grow your culture, like those mini conversations, just what you just said, that was something that was thought out. That was not reactionary in the moment. Is that fair to say? Dave Smart is one of the best coaches in the world, and now you can learn from him with never-before-available access. Three all-access practices and one defensive coaching clinic are available at davesmartbasketball.com. What makes these all-access practice and clinic videos so unique? Dave Smart has won 12 national championships and has a winning percentage of 92%. Dave Smart's Force We Can defensive system is world-renowned and has never been shared in this way before. Dave Smart has a winning record in over 50 games versus NCAA Division I teams, having beaten Wichita State, Baylor, Wisconsin, and many others. Dave Smart is recognized by Jay Wright, Mick Cronin, Jay Triano, and many other top coaches in the world as one of the best minds in basketball. Learn from one of the greatest minds in the game who opened his doors and shared the game with us from one of the most successful basketball programs in the world. Go to davesmartbasketball.com now to learn more and to purchase all four videos. Yeah, I mean, again, 
very thought out, but not the actual emotions of the conversation. The emotions are real. And then I really analyzed my emotions and how that person might've reacted to it and their emotions and what they're telling me. Like, I don't think you can go in and have a plan on how emotionally you're going to act because then they don't believe you. I mean, I would hope that most of the guys who have come through this program like me, but a lot of guys, I wouldn't say a high percentage, but 20%, which is a lot of guys over 21 years, don't particularly like me. 80% probably do, but they trust me. Like they know that my emotions are real and that my words are real. And, you know, sometimes they don't like my words. Sometimes they don't like my emotions. If they don't like my words, I kind of feel like, you know what? Tough. That's what I think. And my words are not based on emotion. They're real. And you really don't have an argument. I'm right. Cause I thought that out when they don't like my emotions, I will talk to them and apologize that for uh, reacting in an emotional way that probably wasn't comfortable for them or that wasn't ideal to get what I, what needs to be conveyed to them. But you still have to show true emotions. And I mean, the one place where I don't know if I show true emotions is during the game with the refs. I think sometimes, most of the time, I really don't care what the ref's calling. I just feel like it's important from a basketball perspective that you're protecting your players. And you act emotional so that it, not even for the refs as much for your players to know, because I'm very, there's not a lot of positive for me. It's like, hey, good job. Well, about time, you know? So in a game, there's a lot of emotion going on with the players. They need to show to see that you're in their corner, even though I really don't have that much of a emotional feeling towards the refs one way or the other. And that's why I actually don't, pick up a lot of technicals is because when I am emotional, sometimes when the ref comes by, I'll say, you know what? I acted like an idiot. Sorry about that. But I had to act like I was protecting them. You know, I, I kind of think you screwed us on that call, but you kind of screwed them on the other end too. So I'm not really that upset because it's kind of all working out. But I do think there's a place in the coaching where you got to show that you're protecting your players. I mean, you know that all good coaches know that there's a place where you have to protect your players. And I feel I have to do it even more than most because I won't let my players talk to the refs. And it's not for any other reason other than some of them, I don't trust what they're going to (laughs) say. Well, and I understand that. Yeah. So how do you hold your players? Like when you say something like that, okay, you can't talk to the refs. What happens? What's a consequence in your program? So somebody doesn't complete an assignment on defense versus someone doesn't talk to the refs or somebody makes a mistake that's unacceptable according to, what you lay out in advance? What are consequences? Because that seems to be a challenge for coaches too, in terms of what are real consequences that impact players? Well, it's different for us, for every player, but it's very clear why it's different. So that, you know, generally, ideally, if a guy talks to a ref, we just take him off. And obviously, if it's Phil Scrub, now he never talked to a ref, he never talked to anybody, but but if he talked to a ref, I'd take him off and I'd say something to him and then he'd be off a lot less than someone who was the seventh, eighth man. And, but it would still be a consequence. You know, if it was late in the game, then I'd lose my mind on and I wouldn't take him off. And then after the game, I'd say in front of the team, I'd say, like, Phil, you realize you're just abusing your ability, right? And I pick Phil because it never happened with Phil, but I would make it very clear, guys, like, if you do it, I'm just taking you off because it's an excuse to get Phil back on. You know, like, like, so it doesn't make a whole lot of sense for you to talk to a rep. With Phil, you know what? I lost it on you, and I'm not sure that's enough. So I wasn't going to take you off because I'm not going to stab myself in the eye trying to make a point to you. In other words, I want to win. So you're going to help me win. So you'll play the last 45 seconds. But you know what? Monday, you and me, we're coming in 10 minutes early. And it's not going to be a fun 10 minutes of running for you. And it's going to be a nightmare. And if you want to play the last three minutes of every game and then come in 15 minutes before the next practice every single game and run till you almost throw up, I'm good with that. But it seems easier just not to talk to the refs. But we have that conversation. It's different for everybody. But there's going to be a price to pay 
no matter who you are, if you're not going to do the things that we feel are important. And consequences for not winning in practice. So, so winning and losing in practice in a drill, what are some of the consequences that you use there? Well, I feel like, again, it changes based on the fight. If the losing team didn't fight, then we're going to run. If they didn't fight to a certain, I feel like there's three levels and there's the fight like crazy and lose on the last possession. And it's been like, it's one of those drills where as a coach, you're just thrilled with how hard everybody competed. So the game ends and you go, well, you still lost. So you got 10 pushups and everybody on the other team knows that they're not doing those 10 pushups, but 10 pushups, who cares? You know, like it's not, no one's dying over 10, like no one's getting fatigued over 10 push-ups. Sometimes I'll even go, you know what? That was so good. Losing team two push-ups. I'll never not make them do anything when it's been a, a battle. I still think you have to hate the fact that you lost, even though you gave an unbelievable love effort and commitment to the win. I still think you got to do something. And sometimes it's two push-ups. Other times, if there was just no effort. It's like, okay, well, you saved yourself during the, the drill, so let's run. We got to get you in shape somehow because you certainly didn't get anything out of the drill, so let's run. And then there's the third level where it's like, you know what? No punishment. You guys don't care if you win or lose anyway, so why would we have any punishment? I mean, this isn't a competitive setting, so since it's a house league setting, let's treat it like house league. Let's go get some water. Let's stretch. You know what? We're going to play bump after we stretch because – it's a house league setting, so let's have some house league fun. And then they really get pissed off at that. Coaches who have you know, watched the videos, the practice videos, you'll see those moments, and it's great. And one of my favorite is when you bring up something from a year ago to remind a player <laughs> about one of their failures the year before, so to speak, and remind them that what they're doing now can help them prevent that now. And it's, again, it's just like this constant psychology that goes back and forth. And again, it's part of the success and uh, staying on philosophy again, maybe, I mean, this is a general thing, but what's the thing that has led to most of your success? Like if you were to narrow down, say one or two things, what do you think the most important things, let's say beyond having great players and recruiting great players, let's just talk about from a coaching perspective. I just think we've done a really, really good job of teaching players to own their own confidence and to have a ton of defense mechanisms when they start losing their confidence to get their confidence and own it back and not allowing a coach to own it certainly not allowing anyone on the other team to own it not needing to fake it because you're so confident in your confidence that you don't need the bravado to make other people in the stands feel like, oh, that guy's confident. And again, I go back to guys like Mike Smart and, and Phil Scrum. They were more confident than anyone who they ever played against in a youth sport game. And I think Phil's success at the pro level and at the national team level is a product of him being able to own his own confidence now. And I think he came in and he wasn't like that at all. I don't think he had hardly any confidence when push came to shove. But yet you got to understand that most of these kids who act confident and have all the bravado and have to do certain things after they score, they don't really own it. It's more an effort to act like they do, knowing that ultimately they don't, that there's a lot of situations that they're really uncomfortable with. And again, part of that is knowing that you're always going to walk into situations where you're not confident. But if you have enough defense mechanisms, you'll always gain that confidence back. You'll always get ownership of it back. I mean, when I go speak to like 50 lawyers who are all successful lawyers and want to hear my philosophy on things, I'm sitting there going, I'm walking into a room and every single one of those people is ultimately smarter than I am. And I'm supposed to help them. But I have enough defense mechanisms to convince myself why I should be confident talking to them. And some of them are messed up. I mean, but I go like, I convince myself how they're not quite as smart as they think they are, that they're kind of number ones, meaning they all think they're smarter than me, but someone in this room convinced them to spend an hour and a half of their day listening to my crap. So they can be that smart. 
they've been convinced that I can help them. So that just sort of gives me confidence that I'm not talking to people who are well beyond me. But I still get nervous. I mean, no matter how much you own your own confidence, you get put in uncomfortable situations. Uh, it's great. And, and definitely everyone that's still listening would think that you have something to share. So you could be confident in that. But you've watched a ton of practices in your lifetime at all levels, at all levels, and been part of you know coaching staffs at the international level and certainly NBA, NCAA, high school, et cetera. You've been to so many different practices. What would be the one thing that stands out for you that coaches could improve the most if you wanted to talk in a generality about those practices? Because I think if coaches watch your practices, that they would see something that maybe would look very different from a lot of other practices that you and I have both watched. So what might be those one thing that you think coaches are missing? Accountability. The need for some level, how you establish that accountability is based on your personality. You're not going to do it the way you do it. You're not going to do it the way I do it because you're not you or you're not me, but it's accountability. And if you want to have sustained success, you have to have accountability all the time. And you can't pretend that things are going well just because you want to believe that they're going well. And along those lines, you can't run a practice with drills that you think will look good in practice and think that that's going to translate over to the game. If they're not, if the players aren't put into uncomfortable situations constantly in in your practice environment, they're not going to react well in uncomfortable situations in a game. And there's always going to be uncomfortable situations against anyone good. So, I mean, I just feel like no one wants to hold people accountable and no one feels comfortable holding people accountable and no one enjoys practices that go really bad. I enjoy bad practices. I enjoy when it goes fully off the rails because it allows you to figure out why it went off the rails, what could happen in a game setting that could get us fully off the rails just like that, and how do we fix that? And how do we fix it for practice so that when we get in a game, we can fix it? But I set up practices where it's going to go in some level off the rails, and I got to figure out why, and I got to figure out how to fix it. And, you know, as much as I set up my practices to go off the rails, a lot of the time it doesn't go off the rails where I plan for it to go off the rails. It goes off the rails somewhere else. And then I got to hold it together. I mean, but I still think it comes down to coaches will not hold their other coaches or their definitely their players accountable to the things that they need to be held accountable to. Well, and this is something that you see constantly at practices. And I speak to this all the time. And, and I get asked this question all the time from coaches who have watched my stuff or come to my practices. And they say, aren't you afraid that you're stopping and starting it too much? And is there a too much? Yeah, of course there's a too much. But at the same time, like, what's the result? Is the result of me not stopping it going to be, we're not going to get better? Our players aren't going to be held accountable? And I think there's a big fear to that. That There's so many practices where you see coaches run a drill or put them in a scrimmage situation, and they literally don't stop it for the whole time, even though players are making mistakes that they've coached. And what you're saying is you're never afraid to stop it, to hold them accountable to something that's important for your team. Oh, no question. But I also agree with that, the whole philosophy of there is too much. But do you know what too much is? Do you know what too little is? I have no idea. I mean, because I have no idea with my team this year, and we just finished a long season. But I certainly wouldn't have any idea of the next team I coach because it's a different group of personalities. And I think too much, too little changes team to team, changes personality to personality. But over the years, there's some things that we've done to make sure that we have as many reps and as few team stoppages as possible while still holding everybody accountable. We very seldom have teams where there's only, like if we're going five on five, that there's only five on a team. We try to have six on a team so that we hold everybody accountable. So every time there's a mistake, there's a sub to that guy and there's a coach talking to that player about what they did wrong. So they're being held accountable, but from a team concept, it's not being stopped. So we have certain rules in our practice that only I'm allowed to stop it as a group, but the other coaches are always allowed to sub whoever they want and coach every single individual mistake. They're not expected to ignore any mistakes Good or bad, like how they handle the mistakes is based on 
you know, whether they're effort mistakes or whether they're ability mistakes. If they're ability mistakes, then you teach and you try to help them get better. If they're effort mistakes, sometimes you're just motivated and motivating whatever way you have to. But only one person can stop it so that we don't get into a situation where multiple people stop and then it gets to be too much, even though individually it's not too much. Well, and to give people just a little bit clearer image too, like your practices are not fluff. Your practices, and you, I know you love my terms, but it's a games approach to coaching. It's, it's small-sided games. And then a lot of one-on-one to generate, again, com- competition, but also to emphasize the things that you do. So it's not like you have drills where you can't coach them. Literally in every situation within a practice, it's almost offense versus defense with the exception of shooting. And most of the time your shooting is outside of practice, even though I think you generally have a, a goal of getting how many shots in a practice? Ideally, 250 threes for most guys or game shots for the guys who, the very few guys. In this day and age, there's very few who aren't shooting threes, but for the very few who aren't shooting threes, they should be getting 300. The guys who are shooting threes, we're trying to get them to 250 threes. And it's all competition-based. And that's within practice. And then what's the expectation out of practice individually or, you know, partner-wise? Are they supposed to get how many shots? I don't have an expectation. I have, if you can't shoot, then you need to shoot. And you need to shoot in a competition setting. So we have a shooting board where they go up and down the shooting ladder and they they challenge each other. So, you know, day to day, some guys will challenge four guys to move higher up the shooting chart. Because when you get to practice, based on where you are in the shooting chart, it allows for the number of, threes you can shoot in a practice so if you're 10th on the shooting chart you're a diver you don't get to shoot many shots in practice so if you want to shoot in practice you better move up the shooting chart and as i said um there's no playing favorites here be good or be be shitty if you're shitty you don't shoot if you're good then you get to shoot and sometimes there's guys who are up on that chart who i go holy crap how do you get up the chart but he's still allowed to shoot it like and it just breeds competition which is the overriding thing that, I mean, coaches can reflect back a little bit on this conversation we've just had. And that's it. There's got to be competition. There's got to be competition. And that's, again, what transfers to the game is that your players are always in game-like situations. And I have that debate with people all the time. Like they say, oh, we're shooting game shots because we're shooting out of an action. But there's no competition within that game shot that it's not game-like. And exactly. everything you do is game-like within your praxis. And there's no fluff. Yeah, I would say 90% of our practices are competition-based and game-like. I do think, and it's funny because I'm coaching my nine-year-old hockey team now with a friend of mine, and he asked me what I liked, what and didn't like about his practice. And I said, I love the hockey sort of uh, structure. But the one thing I said to him that I didn't like and that we've changed is I think there's too much development stuff in a fast-paced drill and I think you need to separate what is development and they do it at a speed that is only development no competition whatsoever and then if you're going to do it at full speed then it's competition and you get better based on improve like finding better ways to win and you know like it's kind of like defensive shuffle if we're going to do defensive shuffle stuff you're either doing it slow and doing it technically perfect and going through it and being precise with everything, or you're doing it fast and you're doing it whatever way you have to do to get it done as quick as possible. And hopefully the best way to do that is by being in balance and being in stance and rocker stepping and finding your athletic way to do it. Because everybody goes, well, they need to do it this way. And I go, you ever watched a PGA golf tournament? Because they're all pretty good and none of them do it the same way. They all have certain things that they all do, but no one swings the same way. They all swing within their body and their athleticism. And I find we make mistakes like, this is how you defense the slide. And I just like, my body's not the same as your body. I don't move the same as you. There are certain things that we should do the same, but they're like 20% of it. The other 80% is based on my body, and it's based on your body. And if you're not going to do it, in a fast way, you're never going to figure out what's best for your body. There's no perfect technique. Right. For shooting, for moving on defense, for anything. But there's parameters or commonalities 
to things where you as a coach, especially with experience, can identify that someone's a little bit outside of these commonalities that maybe you can tweak something that helps them be better within the way they do it. Exactly. But, and that may raise a different question is that your sons play basketball starting from the ground up. Is there one way as a youth coach that you would teach, say, shooting or as you said, defensive slides to start with in that slow learning that you talked about where they move slower, but then as they move on, their techniques will become a little bit more diversified from each other. And then that works within the individual, or is that how you would approach it in terms of a youth coach? Well, I think there's more things when they're young that you can do in a slow process and teach in a slow way where it's within the necessary parameters to be successful. And they can turn that into something that is comfortable athletically for them because they're so young and they can be their muscle memory. It can be their habit. But I still think no matter how young, no matter, there's still certain things like my nine-year-old shoots different than my six-year-old, but they have more commonalities in their shots than say Phil Scrub and Osvaldo Johnny, who are both wonderful shooters, but they weren't taught by the same people when they were young. So they have the parameters that are needed, but they do it very differently. Whereas my son's the main parameters were all taught by the same people to them. So they have more commonalities, but they're still very different because they're different athletically. Is learning how to compete the most important youth skill we can teach? I think so. I mean, I, and I think, I don't know if it's the most important, Chris. I think it's becoming the most important because I feel like there's so many people who are saying that it's not important, that like it's not about competition. It's not about, winning and losing so which is great for the general group but in order to be special like if you're not a competitive person the time you're in grade six grade seven that is a really hard skill to incorporate in someone because they've been told the other for so long like it there it's like the kid at, at, with the raptors i mean when he went to new mexico state he had no bad habits so he got taught how to do things the right way. And now he's an all-star. He's an NBA all-star. If he had to come in to New Mexico State with a million bad habits, it would have been harder for him to be so good now. And I just think if they're so programmed to say it's not competition isn't that important, if you get to them in grade six, grade seven, that's a lot of programming to get out. I mean, to make them believe that competition is important. And, and our life is hard now. I mean, when you graduate university, if you're not a competitive person, you're almost in worse shape than you would have been 20 years ago. Yet, we're trying to teach people that competition isn't the most important thing. And so I think it's very important. And I think probably more so now than it was 20 years ago, because it was more ingrained in you 20 years ago. If you watch, uh, and, and again, this is related to, I don't want this to be an anti-Division One conversation, but you watch an NCAA Division One practice, generally you see seven, eight, nine, ten guys practicing and the rest of them basically not practicing when they get to the bulk of the five on five, four on four, whatever it is. Your practices are very inclusive in the sense that you have three teams of five. Players get almost equal reps in a lot of cases. What is your philosophy on that? Because I know we share that philosophy, but what's your view of that in terms of your focus on including players within practice? Well, I think really with us, everybody gets the same amount of reps until the end of the year where some of our starters get less. And like almost the opposite philosophy in that I feel like, I mean, it's no different than when guys get hurt, not injured, but hurt. So sort of have bruises and, or they're banged up. You know, when Phil Scrubs in fifth year, I kind of want him to get to 95% because what's he really gaining in practice? I mean, he's getting better in practice, but he's been in a thousand practices. I mean, there's only so much he's learning in that practice, whereas getting his body healthy might be more important in terms of him playing at a high level than the 1% difference he's going to get from learning and practice. Whereas the freshman, if he's banged up, it's like, okay, that's fine. It's, he wants to be 100% before he gets in, but by the time he gets in, 
he's going to be so lost that he'll never catch up. Like he might want to be at practice because he's going to get so much out of practice. So my feeling on it is everybody should be getting close to the same reps because you're a team. And in order to have the right culture, everybody has to be respected that way. And I, I think everybody should have an opportunity to knock everybody off their perch in that, you know, our red shirt should be able to come into practice and have a chance to knock off the starters four to six games and be able to go into the team room and talk about it and tell them that they're better than them because they are that day. And I don't think if you don't give them that opportunity, they don't experience that competition. They don't get better. And I think it hurts your team, your whole team culture. But at the end of the year, a guy like Eddie, what he's getting out of going two, two hours and 15 minutes straight is just not worth the possibility of him getting hurt. So what we do is he and one other guy will split time. So we may go for two hours and 15 minutes, but he's only on the floor for an hour and eight minutes. But he's still, he's not out of practice. They still see him as, his team still has to win or lose. So when he's off, he's got a responsibility to help his team win in other ways than, other, than being on the floor. But he's got less opportunity to get injured. So we're kind of tapering without tapering. Because people go, you had a two-hour and fifth-minute practice the day before the national quarterfinal. I go, yep. And you went full-on hard. Yep. Well, aren't you worried that they're just going to be worn out? Well, if you watch closely, Eddie only took part in an hour of that two hours and 15 minutes. You know, But no one notices that. And he's still a full part of the team. But he's not getting beat up. I just think there's many ways to do it. Well, and again... I'm aligned with this and I just think coaches need to give more thought to that. And I would argue that's part of the sustainability of your success, which has been asked many times, I'm sure of you as well, is that your players are developing and you care about developing all your players, not just the players that play. And if anything, it would be, again, as we said, it's you're always able as a coach to modify intensity and duration without ever telling your players. And it could be that simple case that you gave with Eddie, which is one of your post players who, uh, for coaches that don't know your team, is an extremely talented player. And it's like he doesn't need the same reps at certain points of the season as other players do. And, you know, I just think that's important thinking for coaches to think about. And I think it's a big, big, big part of your success as well. And let's wrap up this philosophy part one. Let's call this part one, a philosophy podcast. You beat a lot of Division Ones, and that's probably what brought your team a ton of attention beyond, obviously, Canada. But what are some of the reasons that you've been able to be that good against that level of competition? I mean, again, beyond player talent, which is for people that don't know, Carlton, your talent is on par with Division Ones. There's no question. And I'll give you an example. I've been asked many times as Division Ones come to play you, some Division One friends or colleagues or people that I know, one degree of separation, will contact me and ask for a scout. And I just tell them, I say, prepare. Like, you've got to prepare. And the one guy kind of said, well, we're not ready to prepare at this time of the year. And I told him straight up, and this is really good division one, I said, you're getting beat. You're getting beat if you're not prepared. So what are some of the things that have helped you guys succeed against that level of competition? Well, I think there's a number of sort of facets to that and reasons why we've had some success. And I think some of it is what you said. Like, I think there's a couple of things from a D1 perspective. Like, it's funny. The people who are happy when the U Sport teams beat Division One teams and when we beat those teams, they go, well, they played their best players and Carlton's just better than them and they beat them any time. And, I, you know, uh, I don't know if that's the case. I mean, I think some teams we would beat them any time, but it would be a lot – it would be a different – type of game if it was in February than it is in August. Then there's the group who are all D1 people and they are like fans of D1. It's like, well, they don't even play their main guys and Carlton's practicing year round and it, it's totally different animal. They get killed. And well, those people don't know what they're talking about either. I think it's somewhere in the middle. Like you talk about your buddy who said, well, we don't have time to prepare at that point. And it's true, but neither do we, like in terms of that specific window. Because we only practice, we don't practice any more than 10 times either, which is what they're practicing. The difference is because we have 
kids who can play five years. When we start those 10 practices, we're probably a lot more advanced than the high level D1 teams. Like just because they have brought in a new recruiting class and they've lost some main guys. So even though we're actually practicing the same amount of times, we can start at a far more advanced place with our practices. Secondly, there's the situation where our guys know their roles and because we don't fool around about that. Like we just establish roles so early that well, I guess almost two weeks after the season ends, we talk about the fact that you guys got a month of scrimmages where we're watching to figure out if you can change where we see your role. So you better figure some stuff out because we're going to start establishing like not what they're doing in games, not how they develop, but what their role is in terms of, of our team. Because I think everybody needs to be good at roles in order to play at the highest level. Like if you don't know how to be a role player, it's going to be really difficult to be successful at the highest level. You're going to have to find a level where you can dominate. So I do think our guys, because of the fourth year, fifth year thing, they're and they're not leaving early for the NBA. Our team have a better idea what the roles are when in August. Whereas, you know, Cincinnati lose three main guys and they come into that, those August games and they don't want to say, you know what, these are your roles and you're locked in now. So they kind of play their seven, eight best players, but everybody's kind of trying to show I want this role. So they're not playing at the best level that they could play because the roles aren't. They haven't established those. The biggest thing for us, I think, the biggest reason is the way we play defense is so based on individual scout. We don't need to see what they're running. You know what? Like, everybody goes, well, they can't scout you because it's in August. Well, we can't scout them either. They're a totally different team. They're running different stuff. But we can see every one of their individuals through synergy, through we'll go everywhere to see how individual players play. So when we go into games, we don't spend a lot of time on what people run. Like we understand actions and the game's becoming easier in terms of actions because everybody high ball screens. They all do a million things to get into a high ball. Screen. So like we talk about how to cover actions, but we're really all about how we cover each individual in those actions. And we can prepare for that. And I think most teams aren't based on the individual players they're playing against, they're more based on the actions that the other team run. So it's hard to scout because we got different players. So, and we're going to run different things because we have different players. It's great stuff. And again, a testament to your success. I mean, just the level that your teams have played with for such a long time. So for people that are just learning about it for the first time, I mean, Google Carlton and you'll learn so much about what they do. Dave, I mean, that's a, a great segue talking a little bit about you getting into the individual, individual matchups and, and your defense. And we're going to cover that in part two, where we get into the defense and we get into a little bit of the offensive philosophy as well. And we'll talk about that a little bit more. So coaches, stay tuned for uh, part two next week. Basketball Immersion is one-stop shopping for video learning to stimulate your basketball coaching using evidence-based practices. Watch hundreds of videos covering BDT shooting, zero-second skill training, how we teach using small-sided games and a games approach to coaching, as well as team concepts and systems like trail trap, flow offense, two-sided fast break, and much, much more. NCAA, NBA, pro, high school, and youth coaches are amongst the thousands of coaches who are a part of our community. Go to basketballimmersion.com today to stimulate your basketball coaching. To find out more about Coach and all we spoke about today, please take a look at the show notes for today's episode. I love to share the game and have basketball coaching conversations, so connect with me on social media. You can find all my social media information and all your membership clinic and consulting needs at basketballimmersion.com. That concludes today's episode. I know there are so many podcasts out there. Thank you for taking the time to listen to the basketball podcast with me, your host, Chris Oliver. Please subscribe and share the podcast with your friends and colleagues so that we can keep bringing you the best of what's out there and share the game.